So hi, uh, as Marshall said, I'm Lisa Lippincott. I'm here to talk about the shape of a program, but I'm more specifically here because I'm interested in this question. Why don't we routinely write down the reasons behind our programs in a formal way and have computers check it? Because when you think about it, this would be really valuable. Having computers check our reasoning would help us write programs that work better. And it's not obvious why we don't do this, because we presumably know our reasoning when we write the program. Uh, we're really good at writing things down formally. We have some of the best formal languages at our disposal. And we're really good at having computers check the things that we write down formally. But we don't do this routinely. We hardly ever do this. So there must be some reason. And my best guess about the reason is this. The mathematical tools we use for proofs present a poor user interface for programming, and especially for procedural programming. I think that the math, the, the way we're used to writing math fights the way that we like to write programs. And so we end up writing one or the other, but not both. And I think this may come down in part to an, a common attitude about math. Um, this one, many people understand math as describing timeless, universal truths. Who here has had that idea in their head at some point? <laughs> yes. Um, timeless and universal are the go-to qualities in math. Programming, on the other hand, is all about the specific, connecting particular events together, having them happen at particular places and times. And when we write programs, our watchword is local. Everything that's good about programming style is about local. We want everything to be local because we have a hard time writing programs when there's too much that's global. And math pushes us in the other direction too often. It pushes us towards looking at the global, timeless, universal things instead of the local. So I think if we're going to have math that's practical for programming, we need math that's always local. But to do that, we need to have a good mathematical idea of what local means. And fortunately, there is a branch of math that is all about what local means, and that's topology, the basic mathematics of space. In topology, you describe the um, spaces and shapes by describing what's near, uh, what things are near each other, what things are local to each other. So, that's going to be our goal today. We're going to try to apply topology to find out what local means in programs. But first, a couple of warnings. I'm going to be talking about things you already know, things you already know very well. If you are here at this conference, you ought to be a pretty good programmer by now. Um, but perhaps with language you don't know. And in particular, the code here is written in a fantasy C++, not actual C++, with extensions that make proofs fit into the code. So I've been working on this set of extensions for some years. You can go back to my other talks for more information on how they work. And I'll try to point them out as we come through. But don't take this as real C++ yet. Don't take it as I have the power to convince the standards committee to adopt these things. If you have the power to convince the standards committee to adopt these things, please help out. Um, so with that, I want you to consider, uh, I want you to consider a program 
Every event that happens within a program, in any run of the program, so all the events that happen in all the runs of the program on any machine, and consider that as a shape constrained by the text of the program, the way that plumbing constrains the shape of the water in this building and the way that the events in the flow of water connect to each other. And that's what we're going to be looking at. But first, topology. Topology is about places. It, it's about these places that could be a con the rooms in a conference center. Um, and it's about how the places relate to each other. So here we have a bunch of rooms. And we also need to know about the thresholds, the liminal places, the in-between places that help these rooms connect to each other. So here we have rooms and doorways that connect them to each other. And we model that in topology by saying there are two kinds of meaningful sets. There are open sets, which are meaningful areas that don't include their edges. The edge is outside an open set. And a closed set is a, is a set that includes all of its edges. So two kinds of meaningful sets. And I want to draw attention particularly to that word meaningful. Topology, to a logician at least, is a way of deciding what concepts, what divisions between things matter and which don't. So open sets matter, closed sets matter. Sets that are wishy-washy, some of the edges in, some of the edges out, those we're going to say we have a hard time reasoning about those until you clarify by making them open or closed. So topology gives us meanings that we can work with and lets us relate the meanings to each other. And we get two operations that go with the, um, the open and closed sets. The closure of a set is add on all the edges to make it closed. So a slight expansion of the set can make it closed. The interior of a set is subtract all the edges to make it open. So get a little bit smaller when you make things open. And that's really all there is to the fundamentals of topology. There are a few axioms, but um, it's really pretty simple. And if it sounds simple to you, it's, it's simple. It's, not, it's almost as simple as set theory. It's basically set theory plus things have edges. But the edges let us say things like areas are adjacent if they share an edge. The large purple room is adjacent to the blobby blue hallway here because they share edges. The large purple room is not adjacent to the orange room over here because they don't share an edge. But we can say there is a relationship between the purple room and the orange room. We can get from one to another. Chains of adjacent, con uh, adjacency connect areas together. Topology tells us what connectedness is. If we had a different sort of conference, one where every lecture room is in a different building, some of you might notice there are conferences like that some places, then they wouldn't be connected to each other because there aren't thresholds that let us go from one building to another. We have to go outside the conference and then back inside to another building. So connectedness, topological property. We can use the, this idea of connecting things with edges to make shapes like sequences, a bunch of open sets with edges that overlap to make them adjacent in a sequence. 
more fancily, we can have many sets coming together at the same edge to make branches or loops. But here we run into a problem. When I say that this is a branch and this is a loop, and that's a sequence for that matter, I'm appealing to your intuition about time. Time, of course, very important to procedural programming. Um, and these pictures and the topology underneath them are about space. And space isn't like time because time is directional. Time is famously directional for all the points of the compass. There is only one direction and time is its only measure. So we need something that keeps you from treating your branch like that or treating your loop and your sequence like this. We don't want these paths to be valid paths. So we're going to get a little fancier than ordinary topology. We're going to talk about two topologies at once. With two topologies, we have two kinds of open sets and two kinds of closed sets. So they combine and give us four kinds of meaningful sets. Sets can be backward closed and forward closed, backward open and forward open, or we can have these two combinations that are half open. You might be familiar with the, word, the term half open. That's a bitopological term. Half open is open in one of the topologies and closed in the other. So here, the backward, closed, forward, open sets are half open sets. And of course, backward, open, forward, close, the other kind of half open set. So anytime you're talking about half open sets, you're doing by topology. And this gives a directional nature to the edges because this is the, uh, the backward closed sets include the edge that is described by the, by the backward closed, by the topology that gives you backward closed sets. That's a little circular, but, um, but two kinds of, backward, of edges, two, kind, uh, two topologies. And that lets us change the idea of adjacent that we use. To be adjacent in a bitopological context, you have to be exit to entrance adjacent. Sharing an entrance, sharing an exit doesn't count as adjacent anymore. You can't get from one to the other. So we have unidirectional edges in a bitopological space and unidirectional adjacency. And that lets us put unidirectional edges all through these diagrams, making sure that as long as you only go out through the exits and enter through the entrances, you follow legal paths. And this middle diagram is a branch, and this right, right di left diagram is, um, is a loop. It changes our notion of um, connectedness as well. He, connectedness, again, chains of adjacency. So here we have A is before B because there's a connection from A to B. But there's no connection the other way. Connectedness becomes a directional property before and after. We can also have situations where the, where to, uh, C and D here are bef each before and after the other without being the same because there's a path from C to D, there's a path from D to C. They're connected directionally in both directions, um, even though those two paths aren't the same. And here I want to mention that connectedness is what topologists call a local property because it depends on how much of the scene you're looking at. 
Here, if I restrict my attention to a smaller neighborhood, then C is after D, but D is no longer after C in this neighborhood. Connectedness takes the whole neighborhood you're looking at into account. So it changes as you change scope. If we go back to the wider neighborhood, again, C is after D, D is after C. Both, um, there's connection both ways. If we have a branch, these points, e, the, these areas E and F, are not connected to each other in either direction, even though they are part of this same neighborhood that hangs together. There's no connection e either way. There are alternative possibilities. The, so there's no connection either way, even if we take E and F to be larger than that, push them out so that they share entrances, share exits, they're not exit to entrance. They're, they're not adjacent exit to entrance. So these are still alternate possibilities. And of course, you know that, you program this way, you know these things happen. Um, now, again, if we consider a wider neighborhood, Maybe I run the program, I see the E happens, I look at that output, I go home, I think about it for a while, I come back the next day, I run the program with different parameters and F happens. That's a connection from E to F, but it goes far outside the neighborhood I've shown here. So again, whether things are alternate possibilities can depend on the scope you're looking at. So that gives us three ways, that uh, three different relationships that things might have based on their connectedness. One can be before the other, you can have two alternate possibilities, and you can be both before and after. And I want to point out here that this is making alternative possibilities, possibility is just bidirectional separation in time. Possibility and time are two sides of the same coin when you look at them bitopologically. <sighs> so we know about before and after. We know how to make sequences and branches and loops. But there's a particular statement that has become more and more dear to me as I have explored more of the reasoning about programs. And that's the assertion. Because an assertion, you might say, expresses a fact about program execution. So, good for logicians. But assertions are actually better than facts. There's no question of how to, uh, of how to interpret the assertion. It's got the instructions on the tin. So, if you have an assertion, if you want to find out if it's so, follow the instructions. Assertions are more like experiments. And, like any good experiment, a successful assertion should be repeatable. I should be able to, if the assertion passes once, it should pass over and over and over again as many times as I feel like trying it. And that over and over and over again nature is why I describe an assertion as a circle here. It comes back to where it started. Some people might say that there is no effect to an assertion, but we know any action has an effect. Spectre really showed us that this year. If there's action, you can't undo it. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Um, but here, I've wrapped it into a circle as if nothing happens, nothing has happened if you go all the way around an assertion. 
What I'm saying here is that I'm going to modify the topology. I'm going to throw out any distinction between the moment before um, the assertion executes and the moment after it successfully executes. By changing the topology, we can change our set of meaningful ideas so that we can say the difference between those two times is not meaningful to us. So no meaningful effect. So if an assertion has no meaningful effect, why do we put them in our programs? Why don't we just scoot right by on, on the blue line here? And the answer is the assertion tells us something. An assertion describes its edge in dimensions of space and possibility. It tells us what's going on as we cross that line. So what it's doing is making a description. It's saying five feet high the door and three may walk abreast. And the assertion is a track that we can run our army of dwarves around to tell us that our door fits the specification. And I think you can probably see how assertions relate to possibility because you're used to asserting things that are Boolean. One possibility passes the assertion, one possibility does not. But what about space here? And this leads into a deeper subject that I'm only going to lightly touch on today. There are certain things we need to assert that aren't Boolean because we don't want to branch on them. And often we can't branch on them. We can only test for them. And here are a bunch of examples. We need, if we are going to express how our program's logic works, we need to be able to talk about things being readable or writable. We need to be able to talk about things being destructible, that the lifetime of a thing has started but not ended. We need to be able to talk about memory being deallocatable, either by the regular operator new or, or operator delete or the array operator delete. So all of these core language things over here are conditions that we want to be able to talk about in our code, but generally we don't want to provide a, men a way for, for programs to branch on them. And on the right-hand side here, I have a bunch of library things that have the um, same, uh, that, that run into the same problem. We, we talk about iterators being dereferenceable or, the reach of, or that one iterator is reachable from another. You might think, you can't test for that. But no, you can test for it. You write a loop. You can test for reachability. You can't test for non-reachability because reachability is recursively enumerable, but it's not recursive. Um, we often have functions that disclaim the resizability or reallocatability of a vector. You know, some functions, we pass a vector, we expect it to get resized. Some functions, we pass a non-const vector, but we know that the size or the allocation block isn't going to change. Um, we talk about integers, files, but really integers, because that's what you pass to f, to close, to f close. Integers are sometimes f closable, five is sometimes an f-closable integer. In some contexts, at some times, you can call f-close of five. In other times, in other contexts, you shouldn't. It's not a property like being prime. Five is always prime. But this f-closable is a local property. It depends on the context you're looking at, whether you're allowed to call f-close of five. Um, in the past, for your steady clock, is a very useful sort of thing to assert. 
but in the future or even not in the past is something you never want to assert because time moves too quickly. In the future is volatile, in the past is stable. Um, and down here I have one that is kind of the foundation of all object-oriented programming. I've been using the word proper to indicate that an object satisfies the usual assertions associated with its CV qualified type. If I pass you a vector, you expect to get a proper vector that's built like a vector ought to be. If I pass you a time point, you expect to be able to do the usual time point operations. If I pass you an int, you expect to be able to do the int operations. So proper is just a catch-all, the usual things for that CV qualified type. So noting that all of these things, almost all of these things, end in the same suffix, I call uh, and I can edit these ones that don't to make them end in that suffix. Um, I call these capabilities because they let you do something. They're preconditions to functions that you might call. So I don't want to call fclose without something that's fclosable. I don't want to dereference something that's not dereferenceable. I don't want to deallocate something that's not deallocatable. So these are assertions that we want to make in the preconditions of various functions, and presumably we will see them also in the postconditions of various functions, because otherwise, how would we ever know that we have them? Um, I'm going to point out usable down here. I've been using proper for years, but I think usable is actually a better word. I'm going to try and change to usable in the future. So that's assertions, describing ed its edge in dimensions of space and possibility. And the notion of space comes from these capabilities. When I talk about something being readable, that means there's, there are bytes of memory space. If I talk about something being deallocatable, that means there's space in the heap. Capabilities give a sense of space to assertions, and the capabilities asserted as we go around this circle tell us how big the assertion is, where it happens. Uh, one more thing to say about assertions. Um, is that when actually working through the logic of programs, if not when writing them and testing them, it's important to have two kinds of assertions that have different logical <coughs> senses. So we have claimed assertions, the usual sort of assertion we want to use, is one where the proof, the reason that the assertion is going to pass, is local. So we should be able to look at the code near that assertion to find out why the assertion is going to pass. Posited assertions, the other kind, are sort of a logical cast. Posited assertions tell us um, that we're making an assumption that the programmer expects this to be true, but the proof may be far away. It might be outside the program. It might be a distant part of the program. It might be just in their head some assumption about where the pro about under what circumstances the program is going to be run. So they need to be true, but the proof isn't somewhere we expect to find it. So two kinds of assertions. So before I move on, I'm going to tell a little story about my recent trip to Bristol. When I, went, when I planned my trip to Bristol, I got out a map of the UK, and I plotted a course that ran through Bristol on the map. But there was a problem. 
in a certain sense, Bristol wasn't on my map. I mean, the word Bristol was on my map. But next to the word Bristol, there was just an empty circle. The actual details of Bristol were missing. There was a hole in my map. And instead, there was just an empty circle labeled Bristol. And I wanted to go to particular places in Bristol, so that was a problem. I got out another map of the, where I could find the places to visit while in Bristol. And I plotted a course through Bristol to those places. And the maps overlapped. They, they overlapped in the outskirts of Bristol. And I made sure that my path through the outskirts of Bristol agreed on both maps. And that's how topologists get from one place to another. They get out their maps, and they make sure that where the maps overlap, their paths agree. If I wanted to make a big map that explained everything about my trip, then what I would do is I'd take my map of the UK and my map of Bristol, arrange them so that the outskirts of Bristol lined up on the two and paste them together. And this is something that topologists do. They call this pasting together of maps gluing. You paste together your maps and you get one big map. And gluing is how we form manifolds. That's the big map that we made by pasting little maps together. So, Manifold sounds a little scary, but it's really pretty simple. It's just a whole lot of maps pasted together, making sure they agree in the overlapping regions. And if I was using a bitopological map, I wasn't, but if I was, it would have had separate, way, uh, separate sections for ways into Bristol and ways out of Bristol. And I would have made sure that I went through the ways into Bristol on the way in and the ways out of Bristol on the way out. And that's a bitopological manifold. And the reason I bring this up is that this is how function calls work. This is my favorite syntax for um, the interface to a function the place where the caller and the, and the function and the implementation overlap. We write it as a function body, and you get to the implementation by going through the prologue, and you leave the implementation, assuming you're returning, through the epilogue. And it provides a way for the calling neighborhood, which includes the interface, to overlap with the implementation neighborhood which also includes the interface. So function calls turn our program into a manifold. Each function neighborhood is a single map and, if done right, fits within a single translation unit. And we paste our function neighborhoods together, making them agree at the interfaces in order to make a manifold, which is our entire program. So that's the topological description of how we build a program, how we link. Um, but still, I want to draw a picture. So what can we say about interfaces that tells us something about the shape I want to draw? And I think it comes down to something very similar to what we say about assertions. Assertions have that repeatability property. And function calls, or function interfaces, have something similar to that repeatability property, which is that they're nestable. If I pass the prologue once, if the prologue succeeds, it should succeed over and over and over in the same way each time, as many times as I want to nest the interface. And if we're returning and we pass the epilogue once, it should succeed over and over and over, enough to unroll all of those calls to the prologue. I'm actually matching the numbers here. 
I want to execute the epilogue the same number of times as the prologue because it's important to be able to save, to, to ha let the interface have variables that are declared in the prologue and used in the epilogue because that's what lets us compare the conditions from the start of the implementation and the end of the implementation. And that's why I like one, one reason I went to using function blocks to describe interfaces. I wanted to have that variable scope. But it's actually a rather old idea. If you go back, I, wow, it must be at least 20 years, probably more. This is already how we enforce interfaces on virtual functions. We make a non-virtual function that describes the interface, assert the things, assert the preconditions in its prologue, assert the postconditions in its epilogue, and at this point where I write implementation, a virtual we call the virtual function that has to obey the interface. And that lets a base class enforce an interface on all of its, uh, on all of its overriders. And that's an old idea that I think I probably learned it from Herb Sutter years ago. Um, so with that in hand, this repeatability going in and repeatability going out, I'm going to draw a function interface like this. It's a bit like two assertions. There's a prologue edge, which marks the, the, the edge between the caller and the function. And there's an epilogue edge that marks the edge through which you leave the implementation. I didn't manage to draw in something that is important. There is some connection between these two circles, some sort of bypass to carry those variables that we declare in the prologue and use in the epilogue. I don't quite know how to draw that. I tried a few different things. Maybe there's a kind of bypass in there. Maybe it's more of a donut. That would be cool, because topologists really like donuts. <laughs> um, but one way or another, these need to be connected to each other in a way that makes the epilogue go, th go round the same number of times that the prologue does. So, as with assertions, there are actually two sides to a function interface. What I showed you there was the calling function's <clears throat> point of view, in which the prologue is something that is proved locally. The caller is where we expect to find the proof of any claims in the prologue. But the epilogue, to the caller, if you're just looking at the caller, the epilogue is proved non-locally. It is as if these things were posited because we expect the claims in the epilogue to be proved by the implementation. And similarly, the implementation has a point of view where it takes the things in the prologue, the claims in the prologue, as if they are posited to it, um, it says, yeah, those, the proof must be far away in the caller. Um, and we take the epilogue as the things that we have to prove in the implementation, to get out of the implementation, to return from the implementation. We need to set things up so that the epilogue will succeed. And again, I think the simple, uh, the, the thing that clicks easily for this is the Boolean assertions, but this also applies to capability assertions. If we have, uh, look at operator new, a function which I imagine you are very familiar with the interface to, but maybe not the implementation. Um, the interface is going to say, the thing that, re that, re that is returned, the result of operator, is deallocatable memory. 
And this matches up with a claim in the prologue of operator delete. And this is how operator new connects to operator delete. Operator new gives us something deallocatable, and operator delete takes something that's deallocatable. And if we put this in a picture, in a wider picture of the program, we can suppose we have prog uh, some code that works like this. Um, and of course, don't write this code. Use unique pointer. This is just example code. <laughs> um, but we, we create an object with new, we delete it later. If we look inside these statements, there's some sort of hole that operator new fits into. I mean, operator new is off in a different neighborhood. We don't see what's inside. Operator delete similarly is off in a different neighborhood. But our neighborhood has a couple of holes where, the, where we know it's passing through those interfaces. And we also see in our neighborhood that deallocatable is claimed in the epilogue of operator new and deallocatable is claimed in the prologue of operator delete. And this tells us that there is some sort of connection between these two events. We don't know what's inside deallocatable. I mean, that's private to the memory manager, the heap, that what deallocatable actually means. But we know that there is some sort of tunnel running from operator new to operator delete that carries something. We just don't know what it is. But our neighborhood sees the tunnel And of course, when I talk about a tunnel, tunnel running forward through time, it sounds a bit Gallifreyan, but really we have an earth word for tunnel running forward through time. We call those places. Anytime you're in a place, you are moving forward through time. So places, capabilities, are tunnels forward through time. And of course, there's something that fits into that tunnel. If we look at the heap, it's written this way. In the heap, we know what, when, if we're the person writing the heap code, we know what deallocatable has to mean. It means some weird thing about our free lists or something. Um, and we know that it connects new to delete. And these, are all, these have to be friendly with each other to navigate this connection or call things that are friendly with each other. But the important thing is when we write the, the heap, we have a neighborhood where operator new is connected to operator delete by deallocatability. So a module, a subunit of the program, is connected by the capabilities it uses. The functions connect to each other, and that's the shape of a module. And of course, this applies equally to other sorts of capabilities. Here we have an assignment, or an assignment and a copy construction. Um, and both of these operations have something to do with readability. Um, readability of B is, would be claimed in the epilogue of the copy initialization operation because callers need to know that thing that they initialized is now readable. And readable is claimed in the prologue of this assignment because you can only assign from readable things. And this creates a tunnel. And somehow, I think it should be fairly clear, this tunnel has to carry the value because we know that the value of A went through B and ended up in C. This tunnel, we know even from the outside, carries a value. 
So capabilities can carry value. How do they do that? Well, we have an experiment we can apply. There is one experiment given to us in the language that lets us show that a variable can have more than one value. And that, of course, is the if statement. The if statement relies on the readability of the condition. Here is code for the definition of readability. Require implementation. The implementation is elsewhere. This is only the interface. Um, but here, readable feeds into the if statement. But we know there's a meaningful difference between the two branches of the if statement. So there must be some meaningful difference between the kinds of readability that go down the left side and the kinds of readability that go down the right side. Readability is really a tunnel with two bores, and we can detect the fact that it has two bores because there are some places where those two bores of the tunnel split apart. So the true bore of readability goes down one side, the false bore of readability goes down the other side. So it's not a single unit, it's two things that we usually see adjacent to each other, so we give the same name. Not adjacent, separated in possibility. True and false readability are bidirectionally separated in time because they are alternate possibilities. And this is true of functions that take a const boolean um, as their parameter. Here we have a function. In its prologue, it claims that this const bool is readable, and an epilogue, or usable, sorry, and its epilogue. This const bool is still usable. The usual sorts of things you would assert if you had this sort of parameter. Um, and usable for a const boolean means that it's readable. That's really about all there is to it. So here's a function. How does it interact with those two bores? It really has two components. It is as if there are two different functions, and that value is telling you which one to use. So if you, so, Readable, the true component of readable, only connects to the true component of foo. The false component of readable only connects to the false component of foo. But this breaks down if this isn't const. If we expect writability here, again, we're just expecting usability, but usability for a non-const Boolean includes you can write to it. So here, somehow, readability false connects through foo false to readability true sometimes. And readability true connects through foo true to readability false sometimes. There are two different ways out of these two components of foo. It still splits, but the split is more unidirectional. How is it that a capability like writable can do that? Somehow, writable makes a connection one way to both sides of readability. <clears throat> writability is shaped like this. There's an edge that unidirectionally connects writability to readability and it goes across, it connects to both components of readability. It's a sideways fork. It's not a fork in time. It's more like a fork in space, which we don't usually think of very much when we're programming. But unidirectional connection in space is causality. A causal connection between two capabilities is unidirectional separation. Bidirectional separation in space is what we usually think of as separation in space. Neither one can directly affect the other. There's no spooky action at a distance. 
but unidirectional separation allows for causality. So just like time has a unidirectional separation and a bidirectional separation, which is separation in possibility, space has a unidirectional separation, which is separation in causality, and a bidirectional separation, which is the usual separation in space. <sighs> so if I take this picture and I try to merge it with the other sorts of pictures I've shown you, we can see that somewhere in the neighborhood of Boole, well, we know Boole has an assignment function. We know that if is really a friend of Boole. You couldn't actually write an if statement if you didn't know the, or you couldn't implement an if statement if you didn't know how Boole's work. Um, and readability generated by, by the assignment comes through to the if statement in its two boards, and readability is connected to writability. That's actually a little bit of a problem with this picture. I drew it this way as if readability connects to writability only up there. It actually connects for the entire lifetime of the object. But, I, but when I tried to draw it that way, the picture became a mess. So I will apologize for that little um, miscommunication in the picture. Um, and this gives us a little piece of the implementation neighborhood of Boole, that assignment connect somehow, connects to if, if depends on the value, it comes in two different components, and writability doesn't actually get used by the if statement. Um, and I draw this because there's a particular feature of this picture I want to draw attention to. This place. Here we have a causal edge between writability that connects writability to readability, crossing the temporal edge in the interface to us that, that is the that is the epilogue of assignment. And this picture, edges crossing other edges, is the hallmark of a space that has more than one dimension. This means programs are at least two-dimensional as bitopological spaces. And I'm interested in that because it tells us something about the kinds of math we want, may want to look at programs with. And to describe that, first I have to do a little category theory. <laughs> Suppose we have two categories, sets and functions, topological spaces and continuous functions, which are the usual maps on topological spaces, and we want to relate them to each other. In particular, we want to measure topological spaces using sets. What is measuring using sets? Well, sets are isomorphic if they have the same number of elements. So measuring in the category of measuring using the category of sets is counting. This is an operation that counts something in the um, topological space. And here is an example of a thing that counts things in the topological space. We look at the set of points. How many points are there? And make that a functor. That's our set, our set of points functor is, our, is how we do the measurement. But to really understand a measurement, you need a closed loop. So we're going to look also at another functor from sets back to topological spaces, which gives us an exemplar that shows us what it's like to be, for example, what five, having five elements is like. 
So we might have a space that has five elements. We construct a set of points, and then we can come back making a discrete space of those set of points, and that is the exemplar of having five points. And that lets us close the loop and look at what was left on the table at each end. And to do that, we need two more things. We need a unit and a co-unit, which are natural transformations. Natural transformations are sort of like sheets that you can hang across an area that is bounded by functors. Um, so the unit um, relates a set to the measurement of the exemplar of that set. So we go round trip and we relate where we started from to where we ended up. And the co-unit, likewise, relates, a, uh, relates the exemplar of the measurement of a space back to the original space. And there is a little bit of directionality here. It's not completely um, symmetric. And that asymmetry is where the, it tells us what direction the logic goes. Because what this lets us do is say that, that, is say that reasoning about sets applies to topological spaces. And that's what you want when you measure, when you build a model, when you make a description. Reasoning about the measurement, reasoning about the model should apply to the thing being measured or modeled. So anytime you have reasoning being carried from one domain of thought to another, you should look for an adjunction, which this whole picture is an adjunction. I do want to point out, if you take the co-unit and you push it back through the measurement functor over to here and combine it with the unit, you get a thing called a monad. You might be familiar with monads. We look for them all the time in certain sorts of programming because a monad tells you that you have measured something. It doesn't tell you that you have measured the thing that you thought you were going to measure or that you have modeled the thing that you thought you were going to model. But it does tell you that you have modeled something. So that's an adjunction, a little complicated, but really the, a fundamental thing about a, trying to do logic that spans more than one field of thought. We can take our topological spaces and measure them with sets. But the co-unit here, particularly, is going to tell us we left a lot on the table when we did this measurement. The unit tells us whether we have things that are uh, things in the measurement category that we didn't use fully. Um, but the co-unit here, when we go set of points, make the discrete space, we find out that nothing's connected to each other anymore. We've lost all the information about the connections. So we can use a sharper measurement, a sharper modeling, to talk about the connections. Instead of, instead of measuring with sets, we can also measure with graphs by looking at the graph of paths. And we know this is strictly sharper because this triangle commutes. You can take the, you, you can take the graph of paths and then forget all of its edges and you end up with a set. And that's just like you took the set of points. Um, the way back from graphs is a one-dimensional cell complex, which is a fancy term, but really it's just the spaghetti diagram you're used to seeing when you draw graphs. You take a bunch of points, you hang line segments between them, and you have a one-dimensional cell complex. So that's something. But we're not really interested in topological spaces and graphs for our programming, we know we want to be bi-topological, we want to be directed. So, we can look at bi-topological spaces and directed graphs, and things get a bit more complicated. Here, you notice that reasoning about bi-topological spaces 
applies to topological spaces. The reasoning is downward in the shaded arrow. And reasoning about directed graphs applies to ordinary graphs. The reasoning is downward. They're more complicated, but they capture the essence of what's underneath. And again, we have a one-dimensional cell complex, but at least we know something about the direction the paths are going. And if we wanted to measure even more sharply, instead of directed graphs, we can look at categories and functors. Because categories are just graphs where you know how the edges compose, how, where are just directed graphs where you know how the arrows compose with each other. So now we not only know about how things are connected, but we know how we can join paths end to end if we keep track of a category. And this thing, the fundamental category, is just the category of paths where you join paths together by putting them end to end. But still, not good enough because it's one dimensional. We know we need at least two dimensions to describe programs fully. So what can we do? We can use two-dimensional categories. <laughs> two-dimensional categories not only have objects and edges, but also sheets that run between the boundaries uh, that are delineated, delineated by the edges. Remember the unit and co-unit? Unit and co-unit are uh, are things that happen in two categories because they have an arrow around but also a directed sheet across that arrow. So here we can look at the fundamental two category which is more or less start with the category of paths and then look at the ways paths relate to each other. Um, and we can come back building a two-dimensional cell complex. And of course, it doesn't end there. We can keep going and look at three categories and three-dimensional cell complexes and go to any number of dimensions, even infinite dimensions. Um, but I'm gonna stop here because the slides get a little repetitive after this. but also because I think programs fall somewhere around here. Somewhere in this picture, by topological spaces, three categories, two categories, you know, I know that they're at least two dimensional. I don't know that I didn't miss a dimension so far. I don't understand it that well yet. Um, I kind of doubt four. I don't think I've, you know, intuitively, I don't think I've missed two dimensions. Um, but I think that programs should fit around this picture. But there's a problem. I can't fit programs in this picture because I don't know the answer to this question. What is a morphism between computer programs? What is a function that carries one program to another in a way that respects all of the important aspects of being a computer program? And there's no mathematical way to answer this question because it actually is something about psychology. It's about what we think programs are. That is, what makes a good morphism is the thing that relates the meaningful parts of programs, the meaningful connections between programs to each other, between, a, between parts of a program to each other. So, can't answer this mathematically, but I can take a guess. I'm going to put my marker on this thesis. A morphism between computer programs is a morphism between their bitopological spaces. So, I can't prove this, can't be proven. I could be talked out of this if somebody showed me something that is not captured in the bitopological space 
because then this wouldn't be an inch, uh, this wouldn't be enough. But my guess is that this is the, uh, the is that this is a good answer. A morphism between computer programs is a morphism between their bitopological spaces. Um, so I will put some weasel words on that. That is. I'm interested in morphisms between programs that are written to the same interfaces above and below, and it has to commute with those interfaces. You don't get to change which, fun, you know, which part of the space main is. Um, they, those have to agree. You don't get to change which part of the space printf is. They have to agree. Um, but apart from weasel words, it's just the topological space. So. If somebody can argue me out of this position, I would be really interested in hearing that argument. Um, and at that, I'm mostly going to wrap up, but I want to apologize for one thing, which is this. These colored blocks that I've been drawing all through the talk, they're a bit of a fib. Um, the colored there aren't colored blocks making up our program. Those were just areas where I didn't feel like filling in the details, where something must have been going on, but I didn't show it to you. Um, and really, when you look closely, you'll find that there's nothing solid like that in a function. That is, the function has a bunch of operations, and there are interfaces to those operations. Interfaces, the function calls, it makes interfaces to the basic fundamental operations it calls. But the actual stuff that happens doesn't really happen in your function neighborhood. Everything that happens, happens at some lower level. At some lowest level, there's just a hole in your function, like there's a hole in the map for Bristol. That and where things happen is inside that hole. That is, all of the neighborhoods I've shown you as blocks are composed of nothing but edges. They're like foam. And when we paste together our manifold to make a bigger program out of individual functions, we're just taking pieces of foam and pasting them into the holes in other pieces of foam, and you still have something that's nothing but edges. And you can keep doing that. You can go down to the, the library, down to the operating system, down to the electronics, down to the quantum physics, and it's edges all the way down. You never come to the place where something actually happens <laughs> you only divide things that happen into smaller and smaller things. And the same thing applies going upward. Our function is called by another function, fits into another function, which fits into another function, which fits into main. And main fits into the runtime system. The runtime system fits into the operating system. The operating system fits into the computer. The computer fits into somebody's life. It's edges all the way up. And this isn't really a statement about programs. It's a statement about how we know things. Because we don't know the universe from the bottom up. And we don't know the universe from the top down. Because we don't start at the soles of the shoes, and we don't start at the button on the cap. We start somewhere about the midriff, and we explore outward from there and the limits to what we, exp what we have explored so far are just the interfaces to the things we don't know. So, on that note, thank you for listening, and are there any questions? Eliza, great talk. Thank you. I'm glad you made the slide where you kind of compare, or rather, 
create a relationship between the topology and the directed graph. Because when you were explaining things like branches and loops, I was thinking, this is a directed graph. Why is she choosing to use topology? So I'm maybe missing something. What's the main benefit of using topology instead of directed graph for that kind of representation? OK. Um, so topologies are more general than directed graphs. This isn't just a description of flow control. It's not just a description of data flow. And it's not just a description of dependency. But all of those things are things that we're used to seeing as graphs. Those are projections of our topological space into one-dimensional spaces so that we can see, use them, so that we can look at them as directed graphs. But in fact, the whole program is at least two-dimensional. It can't be represented as a directed graph. OK. Thanks. Hi, it's Tom Becker. I just wanted to confirm, am I understanding correctly, that you're taking state and converting that into space so that you can treat that topologically? Yes, this, this does look at state, at, you know, differences in, sta in state, differences in value are topologically separated from each other, are, are things topologically separated from each other. I have not a question, but a recommendation. Can you please open a slide where, the first most slide where there are two donuts at the same time on the same line? Sorry, that there are two donuts. Donuts on the same. Can, can I you, show you that slide? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what you're can asking. Can you open that slide, please? Um, okay. Uh, it's somewhere after mm -hmm. the first thirty so percent. You're you're looking at some slide yeah. like this, right? Yeah. You were talking about that. There is some connection between one donut and the subsequent donut. And you were uh, thinking about how to draw that. So my recommendation is to draw instead of the donut something like a spiral going out of the surface of the picture and then going to another spiral going down back to the surface of the picture. A tempting idea, but it's not really a swirl because it do these are actually need to be circular, not spiral, because they actually come back to where you, it, well, maybe you have a point. Maybe there is something to, maybe there is some screw, some helical nature going on that I'm missing. Um, There's a problem with the spiral, and is that the mid state can consume and then reinstate the mm. assertion without, yeah. Yeah, the, so the point made without the mic is that the, the, is that the state that's carried is Difficult to represent if I draw them as a spiral. I'm not actually that good at drawing, so I'm not sure I could have actually drawn a spiral here. Um, but maybe like two screws meeting each other would f get the point across somehow, but I can't draw that well. <laughs> it's like on a, on a parking garage, one spiral up, transition, and one spiral down. Ah, it is a bit like a parking garage. OK. Um. OK, thank you for the uh, great presentation on preconditions, postconditions, and asserts, if I can generalize it a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that this maps closely to two things currently being introduced in C++, which is concepts and uh, contracts, uh, both on basically the same kind of idea. Which um, of those do you think this maps more closely to? Oh, um, this is easily confused with concepts, but really has very little to do with concepts. It is dead on contracts. And if I had my druthers, contracts might look a bit more like the syntax I'm using. Um, the proposal on the table at the committee does not. And it doesn't have the same semantics exactly either. Um, but there is something to be said for that proposal is written and well on its path. And this is something that could happen in more years. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, in that case, thank you again. <laughs>